There we go. Hello. Good morning, everyone. Good afternoon. Good evening. This is Anne Carey Ford uh, calling in from California. Welcome. Uh, very, very happy to be the co-host and moderator for John McIntosh as we venture on with these weekly Q and A's. So um, just before we get started, I want to mention that we're going to try to keep this at 55 minutes long. And if you have comments or questions as we go along, please put them in the live comment se section on the right hand side there. And if you want to check out the YouTubes that we've already done, I think three Q and A's uh, in the previous weeks, John's going to pop up his YouTube channel, which was there for just a nanosecond. <laughs> um, He's going to pop it up again, though, I bet. There it is. So that's his YouTube channel, Love Lines WG. And you can catch the previous Q&As. And you can also, if you have a question later, email John, because he loves to get email. It's like his favorite thing. So <laughs> they, they just keep flashing and going away. There it is. But come back, come back. There it is, globalpeaceweb at gmail.com. So you can always write to him. If your question is chosen, uh, you'll be invited to come on with us next week uh, and ask your own question live if you want to. So um, that's always an option. And it's pretty, it's pretty cool to have you know live guests from all over the world. So let's see. Oh, a little bit about me. Um, as I said, my name is Ann Carey Ford, and I've also been receiving some information about the shift that we're in right now, this um, very uncertain time between paradigms. And um, I've shared some of my insights about the shift and about the importance of divine feminine energy on this website voiceofdivinefeminine.com. So I invite you to check that out. And um, please contact me there if you if you want to share any of your own uh, thoughts about about that. I'd love to hear from you. So I'm sure you probably know who John McIntosh is. And we're gonna maybe eliminate this part of the show <laughs> in, a, in the future Q and A's, but I'm just gonna read it anyway, just in case somebody's not familiar with John McIntosh. John was a successful entrepreneur until 1999. He traveled for decades around the world, speaking to tens of thousands of people about personal development before leaving everything behind and diving into self-discovery inquiry. John shares his acquired understanding of this false self identity together with his personal experience of thinking with the heart, which returns you to full consciousness of who you really are through his 27 books and his daily blog articles. So if you'd like to check out John's books, he's just popped up a link for where you can find some of his books. And without further ado, I'm gonna bring John on and he can say a few words before we get into the questions. There Hello. You. Hello. Hi. Um, Take thanks. me away now, John. You can just have the stage to yourself. I'll try to figure out how to do that. There we go. Um, I've just checked um, uh, Facebook, and I'm not absolutely certain that it's uh, playing there. I hope that it is. If it isn't, uh, there'll be a replay. And uh, that'll be found. Uh, actually, it should be playing live on YouTube right now as well. We're experimenting with different uh, uh, ways and means of, of uh, functioning uh, with what is it, still in the experimental uh, stages. Um, uh, but uh, if, uh, if it isn't showing, actually, uh, we'd be happy to hear from anybody that might uh, be able to verify uh, that it's showing up uh, on their screen in the comments uh, so that um, uh, we know that it is actually showing on Facebook. And, and uh, as I said, it's, it's now also in um, uh, YouTube Live. 
uh, where you'll be able to see uh, replays and, uh, and download it if you wish. Now, you'll probably notice that the backdrop um, for uh, the uh, broadcast uh, has uh, behind me what looks like a, a living room and a, a big window looking out onto a courtyard. Uh, this is actually a green screen. And uh, I've done this intentionally um, because I wanted to emphasize right from the, the beginning here uh, through the, the metaphor of the technology that that's actually how we're communicating with one another right now uh, to illustrate uh, the dream nature uh, that our world uh, really is. Uh, we get so caught up in the moment to moment activity. Let's say that uh, you have to go to the grocery store and, and you go out and you uh, get into your car and you, you drive down to the local grocery store and you do your shopping and everything. And, and your attention is probably focused uh, virtually totally on that activity, uh, driving, hopefully safely, uh, arriving, um, looking at your list, getting in the in the the, the grocery store, which um, is not quite as easy as it as it used to be with uh, standing in line and wearing masks and all that sort of thing. At least here in Canada, uh, where I am, uh, but the attention is very much uh, focused on the fact that this is your reality, and it isn't. Um, and this is pretty much the case since childhood. So now just extrapolating that backwards to the screen screen idea, I think most of you probably know that uh, high tech and special effects and all of that sort of thing has just gone wild in the last uh, 20, 30 years. Um, and, uh, and, and with hardly any kind of technological ability, you can do uh, what I'm doing right now. I have this big green sheet behind me uh, where uh, in the room that I'm, I'm in. And a photograph of a living room, a very clear, sharp photograph. You'll notice that I haven't quite got uh, the technology perfect. You can see some, some little uh, crinkly stuff going on around the edges of my headphone set here, uh, which shows that, you know, this is not quite real. Uh, but that, that could just be a glitch in the, in the software and, and not actually be a, a related to a green screen. So, uh, what you're looking at, first of all, is um, an image of someone called John McIntosh. Now, this person doesn't exist anymore because I live as the self. Um, you could say 24-7 clock time. Uh, but, uh, you know, I have a, a license and I have a passport and, and, I, and I still have a, a background and a history, a resume. Uh, and occasionally, if, if something needs to be remembered, uh, from uh, my so-called past, uh, it just comes instantly. But mostly everything that I, I know, that I've studied, including school and, and uh, 40 years or whatever it is since 1976 to now um, of uh, spiritual studies, uh, I've forgotten all of it. Uh, what needs to come comes in the moment because I refer only to uh, the self, refers only to the self. Uh, which is infinite uh, knowledge, infinite awareness. So what you're looking at is a body, but you're not even looking at a body. You're looking at a representation of a body. And you're looking at a living room, but you're not. You're looking at a photograph that looks like a living room. And, and so there's like a dream within a dream, because I'm not there. That is, this body is not there uh, in this picture, which is not there. And it's occurring on a screen, a laptop or, or a cell phone or an iPad or, or whatever device you have, uh, which is showing something which isn't there. And uh, I wanted to emphasize this because if you periodically um, uh, during the day, whenever it, it comes up, and of course, if you put it in your, your memory bank, uh, it will come up. If you think about it, then you'll think about it. Um, if you remind yourself just simply by saying, I, I'd like to become aware of this periodically, uh, the world will present itself in a different way. And what, what actually would be happening, besides the fact that it would become very surreal, is a withdrawal of the hypnosis related to 
the body, mind, identity, and surrounding landscape, the world, and the universe, indeed, everything, uh, including all experiences, everything will begin to fade away as something which just casually is accepted as real. This is, uh, I'll call it extremely powerful, useful in the, the um, dissipation of the false self, which is the false self identity, the body mind identity that we call me. So I wanted to, uh, to emphasize this as a uh, preamble to today's uh, Q&A, uh, just as a little uh, suggestion that you might try uh, in your day-to-day -day life to kind of fade the illusion of the dream. You can think of it as a dimmer switch, um, if that's the right name. I used to call it a rheostat. It's a little knob that that uh, turns the lights up and down, uh, the electricity power up and down, and, and adjusts the, the light, let's say, uh, in a room. It used, used to be very, very common to, to use this uh, dimmer switch to raise or lower the light. So this is a way of, of dimming the, the light, the false light, that suggests that what you're looking at, what you're participating in, what you're doing, seemingly doing, is real. Because the more that fades, the more the real light um, doesn't expand, your awareness of it expands. So let's go back uh, to Anne and um, uh, find out what the first question is. Okay. Um, the first question is from Anonymous. And she writes, my adult child, who is a highly functioning autistic male, announced to our family that he is a female. His, her announcement triggered a myriad of emotions within me. I've done much processing and self-inquiry to transform my limiting beliefs and emotions, fear, guilt, shame, and will continue to as needed. I have experienced firsthand what you speak of when you say, stand in the fire of who you're not. I am experiencing a deeper level of peace than ever before in my life with moment, only occasionally momentary upsets. My relationship with my son daughter has actually greatly supported me in my willingness to surrender. My son daughter seems very unhappy, yet is not ready to receive support or to discuss things further. We are honoring where he, she is now. My concern is if he, she is able to live as a female as desired, that doesn't guarantee happiness. It is my growing direct experience that only through knowing who we really are is true happiness and is only possible now, not in the future. So she has two questions. Um, I'm gonna read them both. In what way, if any, does someone identifying and expressing themselves as transgender have to do with their path to awakening to know their true self? Mm -hmm. The second question is, and is my work about surrendering, loving unconditionally, seeing the self in my child behind form and labels while continuing to put my attention on my own freedom? All ideas of roles, mother, son, etc., seem to be dismantling. Thanks in advance for any insight that you offer. Okay, so uh, we'll we'll deal with both uh, questions, which are uh, I think very germane. Uh, but could you just read the first one again, and then I'll have you read the second one again after. Certainly. Yeah. First question is: In what way, if any? Does someone identifying and expressing themselves as transgender have to do with their path to awakening, to knowing their true self? Right. Okay. Uh, this is, um, okay, that wasn't the way to do it. There we go. Um, this is uh, probably a far more common scenario today uh, than um, it has been for thousands of years. Uh, certainly, uh, even recently, uh, it has been more acceptable to talk about um, the, the various uh, uh, sexual preferences that, uh, that people have and have always had, uh, but it's, uh, as they say, out of the closet. 
and uh, this is extremely good. Anything that has been hidden has has been a cause of distress and disease uh, for certainly the person that has been hiding it, and and very often for those that suspected it or didn't want to talk about it, but but uh, thought that it might exist, and and so a great deal of distress um, has been released. You could call like the steam has been released on uh, a subject which um, uh, has been um, very painful for many, many people in the past and, and not understandable uh, to many, uh, whether they were uh, uh, watching it happen in their family or relationships or whether it was happening to themselves. So uh, let's just uh, look at um, not so much the actual preference uh, or even the phenomena, but more importantly, um, the conditioning behind it or or the variations of it that has caused it one is always one uh, the self is always one it's it's not divisible in any way at all uh, but in order as i've said before uh to know itself it split itself into uh infinite uh, fragments of uh, say rays uh, of light shining through a prism uh and has the appearance of being many while still being one so in that phenomena came again the belief in separation if you don't believe in it you're 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 like as i've said before going to a movie but you've read the book beforehand and it's perhaps not as enjoyable so in this case you believe that these fragments are actually separate individual let's call them selves people individuals the preferences that exist within that individual self are also myriad. And as a result of this, you have this palette of colors, of experiences, of possibilities that the self, the one self that you are, that I am, same self, uh, can experience. This then becomes the conditioning, the attachments, expectations, and identifications tied to memory and imagination. This is the garment. Uh, that is worn and changes from the moment one is born to the to the moment that they leave the, the body, changes moment to moment and sometimes dramatically from day to day. The, the phenomena then becomes totally real as who we, each one, believes we are as long as we're still sleeping uh, to the truth that we are one. So when we come back into a physical body, which is also a dream, reincarnation and karma are both dreams within the grand dream, but the dream of returning to another physical body, which is a dream, uh, is then sculpted um, by the conditioning uh, that we've had in the past and not necessarily all of it. We don't necessarily come in with all of it. Um, but let's say that that um, in this lifetime, someone has come in with, with uh, all of the remaining condition that they have, and they've manifested this body, mind, identity uh, called uh, John or Mary, uh, and uh, their propensity in this particular lifetime is uh, towards uh, this transgender phenomena. I'm not going to get involved in the difference between that and, and um, uh, being homosexual or, or, or uh, being gay in, in any way. Uh, there are many, many different variations, uh, probably more than I'm aware of, uh, but just using the word transgender. Um, and uh, this propensity then is going to color all of their experiences and uh, bring them into contact with experiences that, let's say, um, the average person might not have. What's the point of all this? It's certainly not just to taste and savor contrast, which the, the self is doing, because we're in a, a phase in the great shift right now where we're waking up. Um, the fragmented self is waking up. So you could say that the, the savoring uh, was what brought us, meaning the self, into the dream. Uh, but now uh, we're in this phase, this, this shift out of the dream and into awakening. So then the, the mirrors that show up 
that is the reflections of the projection of the conditioning that you are exhibiting in this lifetime that show up in your world and everything in your world is a precise extrapolation of that conditioning, precise mirror, precise projection of that conditioning. It, it's going to radiate back to you who you believe you are until you reach that line in the sand where you say, I've had enough, and you choose on some level, in some way, your own way to wake up. And so whatever method you're using, let's say you're using uh, self-inquiry, uh, you're asking, uh, to whom is this occurring? Uh, well, it's occurring to me. Well, who am I? And so this can happen a multitude of times in a day. And if you are vigilant about it, uh, you're going to be dissolving layer after layer of, of conditioning uh, that seemed to define who you were. In this case, um, uh, a transgender uh, sexual preference. Now, uh, here's the point. When you come into a phase of awakening that is, let's say your, let's call it your last incarnation as a slumbering God self, as I call it, as a dreamer, then there is a lot greater drama possibilities happening in your life. This is certainly true of the world right now uh, as one. Uh, but in each individual's life, if they are experience a lot, experiencing a lot of drama, and certainly the, uh, the possibility exists for a lot of drama in, in, let's say, the life of someone who's involved in being a transgender. And, and you see, there's no judgment uh, associated with this. <coughs> it's just an observation of a dream. The drama makes it easier to identify who you're not. When, when the judgment has ceased and the awareness, or that is the focus, the attention is on waking up <clears throat> on, on who you're not, pardon me a moment, then the opportunities to experience who you're not become accentuated. And this is the self that you are flowing with the attention or the focus or the desire, call it the desire for freedom that you now have. And so uh, you'll hear this quite frequently and it may be happening in your life. Life can become really, really tough when you've made this, this decision to be free. Um, it's certainly uh, not sitting around the campfire, um, uh, hugging each other uh, all day long and uh, you know wearing flowers in your hair. That can certainly happen, uh, and you can be at some wonder, wonderful events where that sort of thing happens, and many other experiences. But by and large, on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, it's it's really like being being uh, rabbit punched, you know, one after the other. Opportunities, scenarios, experiences, traumas in some cases, certainly drama and stories, are much more elaborate, much more accentuated. When you are on the conscious, I like to call it pathless path to freedom, to the full conscious awareness of who you really are, uh, because you are exposing one after the other, like a uh, like a collapsing house of cards, the conditioning, the layers of conditioning, because you've said yes to it, because you said, yes, I, I choose to be free. Bring it on. I turn over every stone. And so life is giving to you, and let's use this individual, uh, the transgender preference, and he or she may not know yet that this is the reason that this is happening. But the embryo or the possibility of this becoming part of that person's, let's call it a future life, in reality there's no such thing, but, but uh, experiences, ongoing experiences, this could become a part of their ongoing experience if, uh, and certainly in rapid succession, if they come to the moment where they say, I choose to be free. And very often, as I've said before, this comes through suffering. 
because being in that kind of a, a position, and it can be any position, we're just talking about one, but it, it can come with a great deal of grief, a great deal of, of challenge, uh, challenge, a great deal of heartache, um, uh, because uh, the vast majority of people uh, don't necessarily understand this. Uh, they're certainly not looking at it from, from the, the perspective that it's, uh, in most cases, uh, the perspective that it's a, a mirror uh, giving you the opportunity to be free. So the suffering can bring that person, those people, others in other circumstances that are in difficult, very difficult situations very often, to their knees more quickly, and then present them with opportunity after opportunity to look at who they are not more easily. It's an incredible blessing to have this happen in your life, despite the fact that it can be very painful. But waking up, I can assure you, is not a, an easy task. Standing in the fire of who you are is a very, very tangible, real example. It's not metaphorical. It's very, very difficult, but it's very fast. And it can happen literally in a handful of months for some people. In my case, uh, it took about 13 years after I jumped off the cliff um, uh, from the, the dream. Uh, other people have taken, you know, entire lifetimes and, and some people get it very quickly. It uh, depends on what work they've done on themselves in those past <laughs> dream lives. So I, I, I hope that that helps. It's a subject could be spoken about uh, considerably, but uh, hopefully that uh, that's of some uh, value to you. Wow. That was that was really good. <laughs> so the next question is from Nirvana. Uh, I think we need to go over the. the oh, the, you want to do the, the second question? The second question for that. From yeah. anonymous. Okay. Yeah. It says, and is my work about surrendering, loving unconditionally, seeing the self in my child be behind form and labels, while continuing to put my attention on my own freedom? All ideas of roles, mother, son, et cetera, seem to be dismantling. Hmm. Okay, so now now we're moving into um, the the mother that has uh, presented this question and and away from uh, the daughter son. The mother has created, manifested is a better word, this scenario in her life because she has made the choice already to be free, and is standing in the fire of who she is not. So this is a dramatic scenario, which presumably will stay uh, with her as long as, as both of them uh, are incarnated in a body, um, depending on, on you know, the proximity that they have with each other, which might very well be very close. Um, and it allows um, this uh, lady to experience the drama that I was talking about in an accentuated way, which if we go back to her question, she's talking about surrender, which is really the flip side of um, the uh, self-inquiry. There's self-inquiry on one side, who am I? And on the other side is surrender. They're, they're, they're two sides of one coin, but either one um, will bring one to freedom. Uh, it was surrender was uh, what I chose. Um, I didn't even know about uh, self-inquiry uh, until long after I had crossed the bridge. Um, surrender means I choose freedom no matter what. So if you are presented with something which is really dramatic, um, and perhaps for her, it, uh, it's more dramatic than for others. Um, this is an opportunity to re-emphasize this commitment, which was literally something that's done every day. You may only say it once in your life, but it has to be recommitted to frequently because there's so many opportunities to distract, to run away, or to sedate uh, from the fire that exists uh, when you are standing in the fire of, of um, who you're not. So this is an enormous blessing for her. And, uh, it probably will come with a, an ex, a hard expansion 
uh, of compassion. This is compassion is not to be confused with pity. Uh, there are no such things as victims, and I know this is very controversial. But victimhood is a belief that occurs only as a result of the belief in separation. Uh, if there's separation, there must be lessers and greaters, and, and therefore a hierarchy. And so uh, some some are victims and others aren't. Uh, this is an illusion. Uh, but it's very, very much agreed upon illusion by the vast majority of humanity. So compassion uh, is the extension of uh, the love that you are to the love that you are, uh, but certainly with, without pity of any kind. Um, it's, it's genuine, unconditional love. Unconditional love is virtually unknown. Uh, simply because this false self is made out of conditioning and you, you can't have unconditioned love just because you say you have it uh, un until you live as the self all the, all the clock time uh, your love is always conditioned to some extent but compassion uh, is is a an extension of the self to itself that can happen in vignettes in moments frequently when you're faced with with others that are going through very very difficult um, situations and scenarios. So this is uh, definitely um, an expansion opportunity for the surrender that's been made by this lady um, uh, to be free. Okay, so now we get to Nirvana's question. She says, I have a question on relationships. While I know that we are all one and different versions of the same self, the false self always comes with differences which bring conflict. I am from India and in our culture, we are told very strongly that you cannot just walk away from a relationship. Whatever the suffering may be, you need to stay in the relationship. I have found that it helps to focus on the false self and let go of the pattern or to surrender. My life has changed a lot since I started working on my mind. But now I am at a stage where I am feeling my loved ones suffering due to their mind patterns, unnecessary suffering, conflict. I feel helpless and get into the drama of asking them to work on the mind and end up creating conflict. Again, I know this is a trick of the false self. The root of this, I feel, is the attachment to the relationship I have and also insecurity. I know the change has to come within. How do I detach myself from this? Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is um, uh, a very common uh, question to oneself or a question to so-called teachers. Uh, and uh, it, it, let me just digress to the word how. Uh, the false self is always looking for how. I may have mentioned this before. If you go into a bookstore or a library, um, it, 20 or 30% of the shells are devoted to how to. Um, the false self is always looking to, uh, in some way, draw a circle around situations. This is a desire for security, um, for um, uh, some kind of uh, uh, reliable way that, that um, uh, scenarios uh, that are difficult uh, can be handled or hopefully prevented uh, or be protected uh, against. Um, so security, more, more likely insecurity, uh, is at the root of the false self's uh, constant desire to ask how. Uh, the self never asks how. Uh, it, uh, it simply is empty. And um, uh, when something uh, is required uh, to be known uh, for uh, any situation, uh, then the answer, um, the information, it, it just shows up. Um, uh, nevertheless, it's very, very difficult when you're still not fully conscious of the self 24-7 clock time uh, to let go of this uh, desire, very strong desire, to know how to do things and to somehow protect yourself. Um, so the, the detachment from anything, and, and uh, attachment is part of uh, what conditioning is, attachment, expectations, and identifications. Um, attachment to anything is an aspect of 
uh, the conditioning that exists for virtually anyone that's still uh, slumbering uh, as the God self, uh, or perhaps totally uh, hypnotized that they are a person. And th that attachment, uh, in parenthesis, not specific to anything, as, as this lady is, is uh, as Nirvana is, is asking, uh, that attachment is not going to just dissolve uh, because you're uh, so-called working on your mind, I think she mentioned. Um, it's going to dissipate um, as you, uh, and it's really grace that's removing or dissolving or transforming layer after layer of conditioning as you use, if you're using self-inquiry or whatever method you're using, that's the quick method, the direct method. It will just go of its own course. Uh, if you place your attention on getting rid of attachment, getting rid of anything, then what you're doing is you're giving life to the condition that you don't want. Uh, this is why fighting for peace uh, is, um, is a contradiction in terms. You're giving energy to the condition you don't want. And, uh, you know, expand that into any scenario where there's a fight, where there's resistance to anything that you don't want or you want to get rid of, uh, you're going to get more of it. And, and, um, and now that we're in the shift and, and uh, the light is expanding, the awareness of light is expanding so quickly, you'll get it much quicker and much bigger uh, than even 20 years ago, let alone a few hundred years ago. Um, whatever you focus your attention on, whether it's something you want or whether it's something you don't want, you get more of it. And now much, much quicker. It's much easier to shoot yourself in the foot now um, by focusing on what you don't want and trying to get rid of it. So it's the lack of attention. And it's very simple. Um, I don't know an awful lot about oil wells, but uh, I, I remember watching a John Wayne movie years ago where he was explaining to someone I don't know if you all know who John Wayne was, but he's this famous actor years ago. And he was on an oil rig and it was on fire. And what they did to get rid of the fire was to use more fire. Uh, it was like an explosion. And the idea was to uh, extract all the oxygen from the atmosphere uh, in one explosion. And that puts out the fire. It's, it's, uh, it's a contradiction. It seems like a contradiction, but that's how you eliminate anything and actually you're not then using a how you're not doing anything you're not eliminating anything is you take your attention off whatever it is that you want to so-called get rid of you're taking the oxygen the life force out of the fire that is causing this suffering the circumstance um, in this case called attachment so it's placing your attention on what you want. And what is it you want? You want freedom. It's very simple. If you place your attention on the self, on truth, um, perhaps you like the word love. Um, I like the word freedom uh, for many years. Um, I prefer love now, but I use them both. It could be abundance, could be peace, could be truth. Um, it, it could be silence, could be stillness. All of these words mean the same thing. They mean God. They mean the self. They mean pure conscious awareness. Uh, they mean I am. And by placing your attention on that, it matters not whether you have even the slightest understanding of what it means. It doesn't matter. The attention on the truth expands the awareness of it to that aspect of yourself which is sleeping or slumbering or in the process of waking up, perhaps very quickly. It expands the light that then shines on awareness. Actually, that's not exactly how it, how it happens, but let's just say shines on, on awareness of truth. And in that awareness, you become aware of what truth is. You can't make it happen. You can't think yourself into learning something that's true. You can certainly think yourself into learning all kinds of nonsense uh, in the dream world, in the grand dream that isn't true. Um, uh, almost everybody's got an enormous uh, uh, archive or repertoire uh, or library of information at their disposal, all of which is related to the dream world. 
all of which is therefore dovetails back to the origin of the dream world, which is the belief in separation, none of which is true, no matter how good it sounds. Um, true awareness of who you really are comes to you in the moment. Um, it doesn't come through memory, doesn't come through some archive, certainly doesn't come from reading books, going to seminars, or even watching situations like this. This is basically pointing um, you in the direction of who you're not. Um, I can't tell you who you are. I can't tell you what the truth is because you can't put a frame around infinity, but I can definitely tell you who you're not. And attachment, you're not. Um, so uh, there's that. And then uh, another part, which perhaps wasn't exactly part of the question is any attempt to try to change someone, to fix someone, especially someone that's uh, a loved one, you're living with them, they're suffering, um, and uh, they, they don't understand, let's say, what you're doing um, in terms of your focus on truth. Uh, the world is causing them enormous suffering and they don't seem to be getting anything out of it, although they are definitely moving towards their knees, whether, whether it's this month or, or this lifetime is irrelevant, they are moving in that direction if they're suffering. It's not your job to try to fix anyone, to try to change anyone, to try to fix the world. You can't do it. It's not real. Uh, you certainly can help. You can express, you can extend compassion in the moment to a variety of scenarios. Um, and if you're moved, if you're pulled to do that, then certainly you're supposed to, but not to hold on to it after you're done, uh, such as a movement. Uh, if you're pulled to be in a movement for some time, then that's where you're supposed to be for some time. But it's not going to change the conditioning that lies beneath the surface of it. Your job is not to fix a person, a mate, a spouse, the world, the community. Uh, your job is simply to be, capital letters, and that means to be aware of the self. Your attention on and your beingness of the self that you are is more influential in dissipating the illusions occurring in the dream than anything seven or eight billion people can do through all their well-meaning ways and means. One individual shining in the light of truth does more than the entire planet of well-meaning individuals. God bless them. This is where to place your attention. And if you have the opportunity to help in a moment, opportunity presents itself, then go ahead and help because you're pulled to do that. The compassion, uh, the heart, love brought you to that moment, then let go of it and return to the most important thing, which is focusing on the truth, which is the fact that you are God, you are the self and uh, becoming aware of the self. Okay, the next question is from Michelle. She says, when our soul longs to know oneness again, why does there have to be so many practices and so much effort to awaken? Why does it take years of dedication and longing while going through suffering? If we're truly divine, isn't the desire to awaken enough to awaken? Mm -hmm. Uh, this may, may be the most asked question of anyone that has put their toe in the water of, uh, spiritual, um, pursuits. Um, why is it so tough? Uh, well, the conditioning attachments, expectations, and identifications that make up the false self called a person called me, um, in parenthesis, whoever that may be. Uh, has formulated over eons of clock time, also clock time dreaming. It is an enormous um, presence uh, that is rock solid real to most people. So when someone reaches the line in the sand where they've had enough, where they, they can't take the dream any longer, the way it is. It doesn't make any sense. Like in my case, I had everything and I was miserable. Then it feels like, well, 
uh, I, I should just walk out of this room and into that room. I don't want this anymore. I don't want to be here anymore. I don't want to live like this anymore. Um, I can't take it anymore. Thousands of variations of that. Um, but you have uh, all these grappling hooks uh, caught onto your consciousness that say, yeah, but um, you like this and you like to do that. Um, you like to have this. And after all, you spent all these years in university, you've got all these degrees and, and you do have this title and you are that. Multiply that times thousands of scenarios, certainly hundreds that you probably could think of, you know, if you sat down for 20 minutes and wrote them out. This conditioning is formidable and it has to burn away. So the way that it burns away very often for, for many, many people, and certainly in my case, because I was involved in spirituality from 1976 until 1999 before I made the no matter what choice to leave everything behind. Um, no matter what it took. I tried many practices. I read, uh, I, I don't know how many books, but certainly hundreds and hundreds of books. Uh, studied all kinds of ways and means. And I know that, that most of you have probably done the same thing. Um, it's quite possible that uh, you know people, uh, if, if not yourself, uh, you've been to many seminars, you've been to retreats, you've been to different gurus and teachers, you may have traveled the world, you may have been in the presence of of so-called uh, masters, gurus, sages, or what have you. And, and you may have had many epiphanies or satoris or ahas that, that have been exquisitely beautiful, but still something keeps you stuck in this dream. That's the conditioning. That's what continues to pull you back. It is your vigilance, your consistent focused attention on truth that is required and it has to be sincere. You can't fool God, as they say. Um, you, you are found out instantly if, if, if you're wishy-washy about your, your, your attention. Uh, you can't dance at two weddings, I like to say. Uh, you're, you're either focused on truth or, or you're not. And uh, that focus has to be 100%. It doesn't mean to say that you are succeeding, so-called succeeding as the mind thinks of it, 100% of the time. In fact, most of the time you're falling in the ditch. But as you continue to keep your focus vigilantly on the truth in whatever way you choose, I always encourage self-inquiry slash surrender, you will find that those layers very quickly now in the shift, very quickly will burn away, fall away dissolve, transform back into nothingness, which means back into the self from which they arose initially. And that it becomes easier and easier. The fire doesn't go down, it actually goes up. Uh, the suffering that, that seems to be there, the pain, the difficulty that seems to be there may actually go up. But the, the ease with which the fire's put out uh, becomes greater and greater. Uh, this is where they said you're never handed anything you can't handle. Well. You're not handling it. Grace, the love in action is handling it because of your dedicated focus on truth, freedom, love, uh, full awareness of who you are. Huh. I, I just have a little quick question that, re that refers to what you just said. And then what you said earlier in this broadcast about the... Um, the awakening process can sometimes take months or years, depending on how much quote unquote work someone had done on themselves prior to getting on the, getting to the line in the sand moment. So I'm just putting that together and wondering if you have any further thoughts of how that ties together with what you just said. Sure. Um, there have been instances where, uh, for example, the, the master uh, Ramana um, sat in silence, total silence, with um, a devotee who had perhaps never been there before, just showed up. And um, uh, this may have been the first time that they ever sat with him. And in that moment, which might have been an hour, might have been half an hour, could have been 20 minutes, whatever, that person, um, you could say, awakened to who they are. 
Now, they may still have baggage, as I've said before, that will um, uh, try to pull them back onto the stage of dreams. But they are they in that moment became free. Um, there's someone on, online uh, right now, uh, a, a friend that I, that I have and that I speak to frequently, who um, came to the awareness, the clear awareness that this is a dream, unequivocal awareness that this is a dream, not a mental concept. This is much different than just saying, yeah, yeah, that sounds that sounds like that makes sense. There are many people that say that. But this is a heart awareness that, oh, my God, this isn't real. This is not real. It's a it's a Satori or, or, or an epiphany, an aha, that is is shocking in some cases. My God, this is not real. This is really not real, which is the point I was trying to make with this green screen idea. When she got that, uh, that was it. She was off the stage. And very, very quickly, um, moved up, uh, I like to call in the amphitheater, from the baggage stage to the echo stage to the whisper stage, <coughs> where very little of the dream now touches her. Now, this is someone who um, uh, had not been exposed to a great deal of suffering, as many spiritual people have and, 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 and do, uh, as I certainly did. Uh, in my uh, lifetime, this lifetime, uh, because I had a lot of conditioning to uh, dissolve before I reached the stage, even where I was ready to make the sincere commitment to be free. She had already done the work in previous lifetimes. Mm -hmm. Those lifetimes are also dream lifetimes. They didn't mm -hmm. actually happen. This isn't actually happening. But mm -hmm. you know, to just dismiss it like that is, is ludicrous. Uh, yes, it is happening. It's happening as a dream within the self. So it does have a kind of reality. But we can say <coughs> we can say it's it's happening, but it's not happening. Pardon me. <coughs> I think they call it a, <coughs> a Zen cone. Um, a, a divine dichotomy is what I call it, where something is this, but it's also not this. And um, <clears throat> so in those reincarnations, uh, a great deal of work on the self, uh, the false self, was done so that in this lifetime, it just kind of, kind of uh, a little explosion and it kicked her off the stage and uh, <clears throat> into the uh, into the amphitheater uh, where over a very short period of time, uh, she's climbed to the top of the of the stairs into what I call the the phase of whispering. This is not complete liberation or self realization. Um, <clears throat> that's that's when you're completely without conditioning. Mm -hmm. I'm not completely without conditioning. I still have some whispers, not many and hardly ever, but they're still there. So to say, uh, and I wouldn't anyway, to say I'm self realized or or liberated like a Ramana, I, it would be ludicrous. Um, I, I just live as the self, as she does, um, virtually all the clock time, except for <laughs> when a little whiff uh, comes along. So for her, it was much, much easier than for many that go through enormous challenges uh, to reach that stage of awareness. Uh, we've, we've got a couple of minutes left, uh, if there's any other questions. Yeah, super quick. Um, Sass says, reading and listening to you about your method for self-inquiry, which I understand to be as follows. In whom is this thought arising? Me, who am I? Followed by I am that I am. She asks, is that all you do? Just say those words to yourself or are you supposed to focus on a feeling of peace or love when you say these words? Or are the words themselves just spoken in the mind enough to dissolve that layer of tissue paper conditioning to allow the awareness of who you are not to arise? Okay, there's about four questions in there. I don't think I can get to all of them, but let's first of all make a correction that, that after you say, who am I, uh, there is no answer because we're not looking for an answer. We're looking to allow uh, a grace, love and action to shine light on who um, we are not. 
So, you know, we're saying uh, to, to whom is this uh, scenario arising? Me, who am I? That's the end of it. Uh, there's nothing more. Uh, do we need to be in a particular state or frame of mind or, or state of peace or reverence? No. Uh, this can literally happen like a machine gun. You could, you could be uh, walking from here to the park and that might take you 25 minutes and you might have a dozen opportunities to ask this question in that time. You're certainly not going to sit down on the grass and get into a lotus position and ask the question. I mean, you can't, but it isn't necessary. This can be done as you're walking. Um, it doesn't mean to say that you're not uh, sincere. Um, in that respect, you could say reverent. Um, uh, but you don't have to try to put yourself into a certain frame of uh, consciousness in order to ask the questions. What it, whenever it comes up, that's the trigger. You ask the question, you answer it with me. And you just say, who am I? <clears throat> and then on to the next thing. Grace does the heavy lifting. So I think that's about uh, it for today. And uh, uh, what do we need to do? Well, we need to remind people that um, they should probably email us and let us know your feedback. If you have any suggestions for uh, different formats, different, different anything. Uh, different platforms, or if you have a question, right. uh, we, we'd love to hear from you. And again, you'll be invited to ask your own question live if you want to. Mm -hmm. um, that would be awesome. So um, there's John's email there. Right. And so, uh, this is every Thursday at the same time for the time being. Right. Right. For the time being. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. In parenthesis with a question mark. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much for being with us. And, and thank you, Anne, uh, for your valued participation. Uh, it's a joy to be with everyone. Thanks, everyone. Okay. Bye now. Lots of love. Bye for now.